Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Time. Let's be idiotic together. Let's do that. <laughs> it's like a big hug. The power <laughs> of three. <laughs> uh, yes. Look at all the people dropping in saying hi. I think some of these people might know our guest today. Interestingly enough, I thought, mm. I, for the longest time, you stopped showing up in my feeds. And so I thought, what happened to Mark? Uh, you know? And then all of a sudden, you started showing back up again. Like, I've hey, lost he's you. Back. I blocked him <laughs> yeah, for a while. Blocked, it, was, yeah, it was awkward, but yeah, I had to. He, he finally forgave you for that thing you said that one time. <laughs> right, at that time, yeah. That one time at GDC. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah. Speaking of guests, Chris, who is our guest today? Who is this bearded fellow? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, folks, we got Mark Ehlert joining us for the very first time. He's a newbie to Idiotic, but by no means a newbie in our space. Um, Mark, since it is your first time, um, give us your uh, superhero backstory. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Anthropologist and historian by education. Actually worked as a paid anthropologist and historian for a while. Um, uh, grad school, decided I wanted a job, left, went to work in the <laughs> Pentagon. Um, uh, was an actual federal employee and a defense contractor for a long time but working always on the L&D side, emerging technologies, advanced concepts. So um, I am, I disclaimer up front, I'm not an instructional designer. I've never played one on TV or on a podcast. <laughs> um, so I've always come at it from the, the uh, technology side but with the, uh, the, the added spice of being an anthropologist. So I'm very interested in human at the end of the technology. Um, about eight years ago, came out here to the West Coast uh, to work for Amazon was at Amazon for about seven and a half years doing a variety of roles, including managing the enterprise-wide LMS, running Amazon-wide innovation programs, and about three and a half months ago, if I'm looking at the calendar right, uh, made a switch to come over to Unity 3D, one of the top game engines in the world. Hmm. Very cool. So we have a few things to talk about today. Uh, couple? Just, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Just want to catch up or do we want to actually hit a topic? That'd right. Cool. Yeah, we could throw a dart at the <laughs> a dartboard and just pick a topic and go off for well more than 45 minutes. But we should probably <laughs> pick one which might uh, be the most interesting to everybody on our podcast today. Or maybe not. Maybe no the promises. chat room just steers no us in a completely different direction. But when yep. you and I first... Uh, started talking about doing this and having you on the show. Uh, just the whole idea of the, the long history of training departments struggling <laughs> and people wanting to get a seat at the table and the blah, 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 yep. you know, and all that kind of stuff. And um, there, there seems to be a reason why we don't tend to fare too well within the business world at times. So how did you stumble across <laughs> understanding that? Only took a couple of decades, right? <laughs> uh, we were just talking before we went live about it. It really felt like in some ways it was the, the matrix where you can't figure out why something uh, doesn't always work when it seems to us in the business that this is absolutely a, um, a competitive differentiator that uh, learning organizations are, are you know, uh, always coming out on top that we always want to promote a learning culture, all those sorts of things. But there's always been some kind of ceiling about how we're viewed by the C-suite. And it wasn't really until I started working outside of L&D, like at Amazon, when I went from, I was in core HR when I got there managing the LMS. And then I went to a, a different um, organization that was, in a, uh, that was in AWS that was focused on innovation. And uh, just that shift in mindset really got me thinking that, you know, if we look at the, the, the balance sheet for Amazon, um, 
employees come across as, or anybody's, um, employees come across as liabilities. Their costs to be managed. <laughs> and it hit me that you don't invest in costs. And so when we're sitting there trying to make an argument about why we need more instructional designers or why we need to upgrade this tool or that tool or anything about investing in, in uh, training um, infrastructure, um, we're asking executives to invest in a cost. And that's that relies on that to, to win that argument relies on them being um, visionaries beyond what generally accepted accounting principles allow them to be right. So they're going to have to go beyond. And that's fine if you if you if you hit on one who can do that, who's willing to do that. But what it also does is puts us in a really fragile place because if they leave, then the next person, there's no guarantee that they're not going to look at it and go, you know, that's just bad business. Mm -hmm. We need to be minimizing cost and not investing in them. Um, and had so, yeah, that's what I had that's a conversation with someone um, earlier this week or late last week. Anyway, um, uh, like, you know, in the 2007, 2008 downturn, what was the first thing that happened? Well, mm -hmm. training and travel got cut, the two T's, you know. Uh -huh. Um, and that's, a, I think, a, an indication of where, where the, you know, where it sits in, in a lot of corporate minds. Oh, it's it's not it's not core function. It's not needed. It's not it's it's cut it. So I think, right I, there, so. Chris, that's a it's a great point. But I think it's it's that's actually even one layer up. So one of my favorite examples mm -hmm. is there's a guy at AWS, the chief technology officer, there's a guy named Werner Vogels, uh, uh, chief technology officer at AWS. Right. He's also a DJ. Um, amazing guy, amazing tech visionary, right? Like Andy Jassy basically started AWS when Jeff asked him to, but Werner's been there for so long. But if you look on the balance sheet, his he's represented as a cost, hmm. and there's no way for me. Like, uh, let's say I want to, let's say I want to, uh, well, I have Amazon stock, and Werner leaves. There's no way for me to value the company differently without that kind of visionary leader in that seat. So I can't value him right as part of the company the amazon would definitely be worth less in terms of stock if certain like if, if werner left right it just would um and so when we're talking about uh training people and making them better at doing their job and whether whether or not we're talking about we need a course or we need a solution or we need uh to improve skills or whatever we're talking about um we still have to look at how people are accounted for and, and they're accounted for cost. And it's really hard to make that argument to invest in a cost. So, and so I think this is a long fight. It's as long as getting rid of that stupid pyramid that says you remember 5% of this and 10% of that. <laughs> um, by the way, if anybody's listening or watching, that's total whatever. Um, Hokum? <laughs> that's probably the nicest, absolutely <laughs> nicest thing to say about it. But I think it's as long a fight as that to get accounting principles changed. And there, believe me, there are people out there who are fighting it and who, and who are trying to change that. But until that sea change happens across the board, I think L&D needs to understand the environment that's operating in and what it's asking executives to do. It's kind of the reality that we work in that I tell people or I try to pound home to folks. It's like there's this fantasy of instructional design and what we want to be and what we want to build and what we want to have and the impact we want to have on the business or that we think we have on the business. And then there's the reality of how we're perceived and how they how we're actually accounted for within the business. And I know accounting is, isn't a sexy thing to talk about at all it's it's not as much fun as talking about vr it's not as much fun <laughs> as having kevin thorne on here doing a drink and draw with us or anything like that but this is it's it's this Yay, real I'm world that one. we live Woo! in <laughs> <laughs> i know mark's like come on i wanted to be on here and talk about something cool and you make me talk accounting what's up with that no it's just you know it's one of those things brent that i think it it just um after being in the business for a long time and you keep hitting your head against it, uh, you know, at some point you need to step back and go, we need to make this argument in a different way. Yeah. Right. Why is it easier to write a check for a new tool or a new LMS or something like that than it is to say, we're going to invest in people's training. And believe me, one of the things I hate most is when companies say um, people are our biggest asset. <laughs> it's a straight up lie. No, they're not. I can look at your balance sheet and see they're not your biggest asset. Your biggest asset is your headquarters building, 
That should be just asset. <laughs> Next comes like but, your AWS account or something, you know. But, but it's it's the biggest asset in our hearts. <laughs> right, right. No, and I've gotten so many raises based on hearts. You know? <laughs> That's what's really driven it to the top. So yeah, no, it's just one of those things that it, it's foundational, um, and we have to understand that um, uh, that environment and then work to change it as best we can. Right, mm-hmm. come up with alternative ways. It's the same thing with. Um, we're in the same problem with innovation, right? So when you're when you're trying to do something innovative, uh, one of my um, core beliefs there is if you don't go in with a possibility for failure, you're really not being innovative, right? So um, how do you account at the end of the year that your team tried 12 things and eight of them failed? Or what they didn't do is work, right? How do you account for that as that's actually a success? We're trying new things. We're figuring out things that don't work. Uh, we're not set up to um, uh, either philosophically or financially account for those sorts of things. So yeah, it's just an appreciation for that bedrock that we try to set everything else on. It is. Well, we got some folks answering the poll, and I think some of the questions are interesting. I forgot to tell you. Oh, yeah. I put a poll in. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> What they can see me, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I just threw in a couple options, but I think most people are putting in their own. I knew there would be a heck of a lot more, but I just made yeah. some up. I said, What's your training team's biggest struggle within the org? One, I put no respect for the work we do, uh, we don't have a seat at the table, budget is too small, SMEs don't take time for interviews, reviews, etc. And uh, I also gave everybody the option to tell us other issues they're having in the chat. And boy, we've got a few. So uh, <laughs> maybe we should hit up a couple of these and, uh, and talk about them. Jack, Jacqueline writes, mm-hmm. shifting priorities with our enablement staff. That's an interesting one. So does is enablement seem it's seen as more important, Jacqueline, or is that how you're seeing that? Or am I reading that wrong? Yeah, toss a little bit more detail into the chat there for that one. Um, and, yeah. and Elisa is saying, um, poll other, no comprehension of our workload, how long it takes to complete projects. So we're given unrealistic uh, you know, deadlines, which, which yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's a chronic problem in our space, the not just unrealistic deadlines, but that whole, well, we don't that's not how it works. That's not what we need to do. You know, people not understanding what it is that we feel sure. is the value that, that we're bringing in. No, I remember when I was back in the Pentagon, uh, we had a new chief of Naval operations come in, a guy named Vern Clark. And in the history of the Navy, Vern Clark was the first chief of Naval operations who had been a trainer in a past life. And he started doing some uh, shifting some of the fundamental ways that the Navy approached training. Like one of them was saying, we're the United States Navy. We project military might on the sea. Why are we running a chef school when there are great chef schools out there? So why don't we just send pe- sailors to chef school and then they'll come back and they'll be better taught than we're doing it. Right. So, mm. but you're right. And, but again, think about this is um, why don't we have more chief execs who come from our, our sector? And it's because or any, um, right. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I, and I think it goes to that fundamental thing is that you promote people who drive profit and people understand that and we're maintaining the line on a cost. And until we start, you know, changing that philosophy and get people to understand that, wow, you're really, um, you're really helping drive a differentiator for the company. It's tough to get that next CEO, COO level spot. Well, if the core, and I, I think it's just a good point, and, and maybe this is really obvious to everyone, but just by the uh-huh. nature of conversations out on the internet, I just assumed that, that people were struggling with this and I thought it was important to talk about. So I kind of feel like maybe we should step it back a little bit and just maybe spend just two minutes. Like when you're talking about the expense and you say words like cost, what's the mm-hmm. other alternative? Like what could we be? And, and like, what, what, are, what are the two options in accounting in business speak? That, that can help us rethink how we do the work we do. I mean, you know, the, so I think one of the things I remember is uh, um, playing the early kind of mock stock market games, right? There used to be one for like celebrities and athletes and movies even, right? Mm-hmm. But think about that. Like, think about if, if there was an internal stock market for employee value. 
right? And that would be interesting. And and the way you increase your value in the market is by training, by learning a new skill, by you know, by, you know, by establishing a new performance threshold. Um, and maybe there's a way that you know other teams other than the one you're on can, you know, I'd like to acquire that asset and I'm willing to pay more than the market rate is for it. Right. But it thinking about, and I don't mean that to, to put people in a stock market, but thinking about people as assets and figuring out a way to reflect like your worth to your company isn't reflected on the sheet. So how do we change that? Right. So how do we look at you as an asset? Right. Like I remember when I went to work uh, at one company, uh, I walked down the hall and met one of the marketing people and I was like, wait. And I said his name again. And I said, you're, and I you know, said his name and he's like, yeah. And I go, I know you from Twitter. You've got like 15,000 followers, dude. Like, and this is like nine years ago. Right. And I was like, do they know who you are? He's like, no, they have no idea. And this is, this is one of the marketing people who hosted like, like you do like a weekly podcast to like, you know, a couple dozen thousand people. Uh, on on the topics and he's being treated just like somebody else in the marketing department and like you have no appreciation for the asset that's sitting there so we need to talk about we need to regard people as assets and not just put that on that company slide that says they're our biggest assets (laughs) and and how do we and then and then in turn so i i think the the bottom line there is if that ever gets changed then that in turn increases our value because we're the ones who help people increase their value. So if we're able to increase the value of the human assets within the organization, we in turn then become more well-respected as actually having value within the enterprise. hundred percent. And it's, you know, uh, I've worked in uh, doing training and stuff for sales enablement teams before. And that's actually one of those um, they do tend to shift around a lot because sales teams shift priorities and focus based on what they're trying to sell and the the numbers they're trying to hit. But sales enablement is always one of those ones. It's kind of, um, I don't know, my experience, it was recognized as important. Like you had to get new salespeople up to speed. Like a trained salesperson was worth more than the new guy just coming through the door, right? They got that because it was a, the direct link to performance and they could see that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they valued, the training department necessarily more so, but they valued this asset that we created for them. Right. So again, it's just one of these things where uh, I I think there's that divergent between people who go into uh, L and D and then people who go into like the CFO side of the business and we don't talk. (laughs) And so we don't confront this issue. Um, So more confrontation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Put them up, guys. That's right. I, I think most training people are just too nice, too. I think we we like to be helpful. We like to, you know, we we like that human aspect of the work that we do. At least I think most of us do. Well, um, someone had a great point down there in the, the chat, too, that companies are looking for penny stocks <laughs> that outperform. And that's yeah. that's 100%. And uh, that's one of those things that's just not going to change. But, um, you know, if you looked at your, if we had a way to look at someone who'd been at a company 10 years and value them differently than someone you just hired and for whatever reason you happen to be paying the two the same salary, if we could say, well, clearly I want the, the 10 year person to stay, they, you know, no more. That would change things for, for LND overnight. Yeah, it's interesting though, but there's that same double edged sword though, as the higher up the food chain you go, the, the easier it is for somebody to see you as a line item that's easiest to cut when it's time for departments to cut stocks. It's like, who's who's the highest salary on my staff? He, he, he or she is the easiest one uh, to, to get rid of, to meet my uh, cut your department expenses by 10%. I've seen that 100%. happen before too. <laughs> 100%. And that's because you're cutting costs, right? Yeah. You're, you're, not going to, you're not going to get up there Chris, to your point, it's like, uh, you know, in 2008, no one said, you know, we need to really sell the headquarters building. <laughs> no one said that, right? No. Um, but we'll cut the training department. We'll cut we'll cut travel um, because those are costs. Uh, this is an asset that we have, right? So, yeah, I know it's a, it, you know, uh, it might be one of those things that's self-evident. And I think part of the problem is we don't know how to start fighting it. Yeah. 
Um, or at least, or at least accepting what it is and, and changing our behaviors and, and under, and I guess yeah. making decisions based on the fact that, okay, we will, we're a cost center. Yes, we'll work towards changing it, but how can we behave differently and not be frustrated by the fact that we don't understand that we're a cost center? Right? I think that's really the biggest point I'd like to share with the, the community today is that, I, that that understanding this hopefully will alleviate people's anxiety and frustration for all of <laughs> these why? different, different, yeah, these different things. So you can, you can, we can start to shift our mindset as training professionals in our organizations and start to behave and function and give presentations with the mindset of, we understand that we're a cost center. Here's what we would like to do to be yep. a part of the business and help you guys manage this cost center. I think one of the things that it reminds me of is when I went to work in the, the innovation team that I was on at Amazon, uh, our VP had come over from uh, Google X. And one of the problems Google X had was that they would come up with an idea, spin it up, and then kind of throw it over the wall to, to main Google, right? And then a team on main Google would take it and run with it and, uh, you know, let's say make it a, a huge new product that got released. And that line of value would get drawn back to that team that launched it instead of the idea, the team that came up with the idea. And so I think there's a continuing challenge. And one way to fight it is to make sure that, you know, we've always talked about measuring performance and that sort of thing, but th those fights are, are absolutely critical to be able to draw that line of value from what we do mm -hmm. to what the company gets, right? Like sales enablement is an easy one. I can compare the performance of an untrained sales associate to a trained sales associate and give you a number that is the, the delta that training impacted, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be able to do that a lot so that we're defending that uh, financial stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would we refer to that it, it, using one of those uh, cones or one of those uh, long standing, uh, what the, the, the levels, the, uh, was it, are we talking level four here? If we want to go back to old school conversations, Mark, <laughs> no, I, you know, um, I, I have, a, I have a, an, an inherent allergic reaction to anything is, that is six of this and five of that and seven of that. Cause I always want to know what got left out. Like what was the eighth step? If you got seven steps to success, like what was the eighth one? Like what didn't make the cut? Right. Um, so what I think is like, even, even at the lowest level of what we do, we need to be able to show that return on the investment, right? Like, yeah. um, I think- uh, Oh, you're are... talking about the ROI, but doesn't well, that give you a rash and hives too? <laughs> no, not now, not now that I get it, right? Um, <laughs> like onboarding for the longest time. I, I think I think the pandemic's actually shifted how we, how we think about onboarding. And actually it's some things that I think companies have really struggled with during the pandemic yeah. is how do you onboard virtual employees? And I think people are starting to recognize the value now, like from even a retention standpoint of onboarding, right? And so we just need to continue that kind of wave where people start to get it now, right? Even if we go back into the offices and all that kind of good stuff, it, it, we shouldn't drop it. Oh, no. I, and I mean, I, I think actually uh, instructional designers and L&D departments are really uniquely positioned in this new hybrid world to have yeah. a, amazing impact. Um, dealt with hybrid worlds for as long as we can remember, right? Since the dawn of CBT. Um, and so more than any other aspect of the organization, we've been used to dealing with hybrid classes and how we get our point across in a hybrid fashion for the longest. We just need to be better at drawing that line about, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, how long did it take you to switch to totally virtual instruction? Yeah. Right. And so you measure that and you're like, wow. Okay. So that's an indicator of companies resilience. And that's, that's more important than ever. I think, you know, in some ways the pandemic is a window. I'm not going to call it something that was that awful, like an opportunity, but it's a window into change. And it's, yeah. a, it's a, it's a way that we can, we can come out of it doing things differently. Right. Because we've been forced to. Um, and I think we can think differently about how we value the contribution that L&D makes.
<laughs> Jacqueline's got a great question in the question panel, uh, you know, relating to that whole ability to prove our value, et cetera. So, so what do people find is the best way to show growth in employees, uh, pre and post metrics, surveys, learning outcomes, um, you know, what works best? What's the best way to have that conversation or to bring all that, the above that data forward? Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think also uh, retention right now, right? If you, if you look at it, you know, I don't really, I don't like the phrase, the great resignation uh, because I think it was more fundamental than that. It was a, it was a tectonic shift in the labor market, but mm. if you, but you know, there've been a couple articles on some rather large companies right now struggling with their retention. And so one way to look at, um, L and D's contribution is if you can track uh, touching L and D generated content with the retention of an employee, and if those two things are are not just correlation but causation, right? If you can track that, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good value line to drive, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think the challenge becomes once you get past um, mid and into like uh, early senior management, uh, you're the contact hours they have with L and D content starts to drop off remarkably. Um, and so figuring out how to bolster that and then continue to look at that retention. But I think retention is a, is especially now is more important than ever to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the great resignation, it, it um, it's to actually think of it as the great enablement, right? So many people just decide, you know what, the context has changed. I can move and I'm going to yeah. do it. I've, I've put up with this, you know, maybe because it was, you know, suddenly I can work for a company in another city or, um, or, uh, you know, in some of those, uh, some of those other labor markets that are, that are really lacking, you know what, I don't need to take crap all day from customers, you know, waiting, waiting tables. I'm going to make this change that I've always wanted to do, uh, and, and find something else to do. I've, I've had or I don't have to, this. you know, have a, uh, like my last commute in DC was, mm. uh, about an hour and 15 one way in the morning at five o'clock right and you were only going five miles i was i was traveling <laughs> a distance but man at five o'clock um you know to drive 60 miles um to have that time back is huge yeah. right um and chris you're spot on like we should be um showing how l d is positioned to to make use of that and they say, we don't care where you are. We can still, we're the, we're the best suited in the company to actually bring people together um, better even than, than, you know, um, onboarding teams or, or that, that new hire orientation team from uh, HR, because they've always had the new hires come into the office. And we've, for, you know, 30 years, we've been dealing with hybrid classes. Uh, we've got more experience than anybody. And so that's definitely one way to, um, to, to pump up the value, I think. So you you mentioned in your in your opening, uh, given a, a, a brief history about yourself, we appreciate <laughs> you keeping it short. Um, there's a whole lot we could go back and talk about, which I'd love to at some point, but I don't think we'll have time today. But you, but going into Unity with all of the things you know now, I'm super curious about uh, you know that new gig you've got over there and what are some of those things that you're taking that you've learned like this with you and how well, do you intend to implement them? Yeah. The coolest thing is, well, uh, actually it's, it's, uh, you know, when, when did we go to GDC? Like, I mean, that ah, was, I've got that. Hold like on, 2005, you, something like that. Exactly. When we went here. Oh, there, oh, there you go. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the OG. But thank, thank you for bringing it. that up. No, I yes, appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, no worries, man. They're right there. Yeah. So it's no. 06. Yes. I can't, that's, uh, that's it was your beard did. actually longer than your hair at that point. I can't, <laughs> I believe so. I think it was, <laughs> but so it's interesting to, to not be, um, kind of, uh, game adjacent anymore. So it's interesting to be sitting in this, um, in this space. Right. The other part is the, yeah. the, the piece that I work in, the team that I work on uh, is the social impact team. And so uh, my vice president, Jessica Lindell, uh, when uh, Unity was going through their IPO, cast some, some magic spell and had um, the company carve off a portion of the IPO to fund a social impact org, right? To do good. And uh, so my team is social impact creators team. And so like we've got 
uh, our uh, Unity for Humanity Summit coming up on November 2nd. It's, it's free. It's uh, totally virtual. Uh, and we're doing an open call. So we, we award grants to creators who are working on different projects. So one of the things that, I mean, you know, baseline, I'm not, I'm not being my anthropologist and historian self anymore. I'm not digging in. I still use the skills, <laughs> but what I, you know, base level, what I really am as a program manager. And when I, when I was looking around for something else to do, you know, it hits you that you can either program manage something where you don't really move the needle, or you can program manage something that has a chance at the end of the day to do good for people. And so we're launching, um, you know, we've launched creators who work on uh, all kinds of social justice issues, uh, income equality, um, uh, uh, land equality. So um, if you look, you know, there's actually oil drilling in L.A. And you ask, you know, gosh, what neighborhoods are they drilling for oil in? And you can pretty much guess. Mm. Right. But one of the things that's amazing about Unity as a tool for those social impact creators is that you can create some incredibly immersive emotional evocative experiences that come across you know so we deal in in 2d 3d uh, ar xr vr right so you can use the platform to build in any of those you can use it to build a game you can use it to build a movie um so i think one of the coolest things is working in a really creative space with insanely creative people and at the end of the day all i'm trying to do is is figure out how to make their path to what they want to do easier and then just get out of the way. Um, so that part's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm digging it. Neato. That sounds like, um, yeah, that's in the dream job category for sure. You know, <laughs> and it's it's one of those things where, um, so, you know, uh, from a, like, to tie it back to L&D, one of the things that's really impactful to me is uh, I'm trying to make membership in our network of creators really just a valuable thing on its own. And I think if you look at some of the products that are hitting the market now uh, that seek to make networks more visible and to allow people to connect more easily, either intra or inter company, that's what they're trying to play off of. Or that's what they're trying to lean into is making membership in that network really valuable. Like I was telling my uh, son when we we're talking about college, I was like, you know, one of the main values you're going to get out of going to college is you get access to the network. That's, I mean, my, my first job out of undergrad, uh, I worked for my, my fraternity headquarters and in two years I visited 90 campuses. And what I can tell you is that from Princeton to a community college, your, the, the, the difference in your undergraduate first two years worth of education, the Delta is not that great. Yeah. The biggest difference though, is access to the network. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so how we how we look at the products we deliver uh, differently, um, how we embrace things like uh, if people aren't learning from courses or the content we're creating, can we create more opportunities? Like how do we engineer opportunities for people to learn and how do we make membership in that network of learning more valuable and more visible? I think that's that's something I'm leaning into and something I took from L&D. Very cool. Yep. Well, it would be def definitely be interesting to find out how that goes um, after you've got a little bit of further time under the belt. You know, you've got some measurements. Uh, to well, yeah. Um, and, you know, no kidding. I'm actually really looking forward to our uh, to our um, uh, our summit. Uh, I've met a bunch of the creators already, and they're uh, incredibly thoughtful people who I've never you want to talk about doing a lot with a little. Um, I've never seen a group uh, do more with less money. Um, and Unity tries to help out, obviously, as much as we can, but we'll never be able to, you know, uh, supply all the demand. Uh, but it's really, it's it's heartening to see the work that, that people are doing. And I think um, L&D can lean into that space as well. There's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the biggest um, things that was, uh, we were talking about at AWS before I left is, you know, where do we put, um, where do we put training centers? Where do we focus? trying to drive training populations. And, and uh, one of the biggest answers was uh, look for towns that have, that are situated with really large state or federal prisons, because that population coming out is, is hungry to learn a skill, hungry to change their life. And you're never going to find people who once they lock on are more uh, dedicated and uh, um, uh, invested in what you're providing them, right? You, you have a chance to make a huge Delta there. Uh, and I think that could show a huge 
uh, any, and in a purely capitalistic sense, you can make the huge Delta transfers. Um, yeah. You know, you'll, you'll create some really loyal employees. You'll create some people who are really dedicated to the job. Um, so think about how we do what we do differently in order to, to drive like different buckets of value. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. And it ties right back to, you know, the, the, the main idea of the conversation today is rethinking that ourselves as a cost center, what, but what are those other valuable ways we can do it and thinking about things differently? I don't think a lot of people would have thought of that, that I don't think prisons was going to be the word I was going to hear coming out of your mouth when you started <laughs> that sentence that that wasn't. And I was like, Oh, and then I'm like, Oh yeah, it does make sense. Right. And so, right. Right. It lends itself to that thinking differently. And we're, we're getting close to our uh, our 45 minutes. We still have we still have time. But I, I just wanted to mention to folks, I, I dropped in a little sentence at the bottom of the description just to see if people actually read my descriptions. <laughs> and and uh, nobody asked the question. <laughs> I, 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 I want <laughs> I just wanted to go way back in the time machine and talk about SCORM and the good old days. Uh, I believe it was uh, the DOD that uh, caused all of the current, uh, <laughs> made SCORM. I, I think what you mean is enabled. You mean <laughs> ah, enabled. Yes, okay, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, in case anybody who's who's new doesn't remember, can't cast their mind back that far, uh, it was DOD. And it was DOD because uh, we got tired of, having a vendor tell us that I know you just spent $10 million to create, you know, Humvee mechanics training for the army, but we need it for the Navy and yours are blue instead of green. And we can't change that. Right. We can't take that course from one to another. So, um, it was, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was around <laughs> the table when we thought up the name. Um, so it, it's been, it's been horribly misunderstood, uh, but it needed to be done. So, uh, yeah, nobody else. Was, it was DOD as the 800 pound gorilla with the budget in the room is what what got people <laughs> to start thinking like that. Right. Interoperability. But if you want to look at uh, if you want to look up a good one, look at uh, Corey Doctorow talks about adversarial interoperability. Right. And at the heart of it, that's one of the things that SCORM was looking to drive was competition between companies when you're out of a, a, a software based lock in. Right. Like if anybody remembers uh, Trillion, uh, the instant message app Trillion. Because you had all your different instant message apps and Trillion could bring them all together in one interface, right? That's called adversarial interoperability. People are competing on features and they weren't competing on the fact that we bought this product and now the sales cycle is 18 months long and we're locked into it and we signed a contract for it, right? They're competing on feature sets. So um, uh, interoperability was was important and still is. And yeah, I just, I, yeah, I, yeah I like Scorm's misunderstood, <laughs> but uh, you didn't bring that one up. Thank you, Brent. Yeah, For, now, okay, so Mark's going to come on and talk about SCORM and accounting. Everybody check in. It's going to be an awesome 45 Excitement. minutes. Excitement. Woo. <laughs> Remind me to hire you as my personal PR agent, man. <laughs> in 205 episodes of doing Idiotic uh, here, and this is the first time that someone's actually brought Corey Doctorow into a conversation. So, hey, innovation innovation still is happening so at work right in front of our eyes you got to read walk away walk away and unauthorized bread yeah i'll go was... on about Corey. yeah <laughs> oh yeah uh, that, that could be a whole tangent and truthfully i never thought in a in a corporate uh training focused uh podcast we would actually be bringing him up because he does seem somewhat adversarial to a lot of the things that uh that we end up having to do in our in our jobs but uh he is, but he puts, he put, he's, he's one of the greatest at making you think differently about what you see in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, copyright is, uh, you know, Brent, you brought up, um, you know, you showed that picture from Flickr, right? And I mean, you still you can still go on Flickr and, and find Creative Commons, um, Commons licensed uh, material. So, you know, uh, repurposable content that we can all use and have access to is something that's near and dear to to instructional designers hearts right i mean like we're constantly looking for content to drop into courses or, or the content that we're building and so corey's definitely one of those great thinkers who makes you think differently about how content gets locked in and tied up um mm. and how terms of service actually work and great now i've done accounting scorn and terms of service i'm just gonna go i'm gonna go ahead and go i'm gonna <laughs> wow 
Uh, well, we see me for should, all the exciting sessions. We should probably just at the beginning of our sessions just uh, uh, had a checkbox. Yes, I listened to Idiotic this week. Let me move on so I can use the tool <laughs> in terms of service. Right. Uh, yeah, we no, forgot it, about I, that. I think the thing that gets me is it comes, I'll take it all the way back to like anthropology and archaeology is you start excavating this stuff and that's how you find out what it really means. One of my favorite stories, and there were at times like, uh, was doing a, a, a archaeological dig. Uh, we got uh, archaeologists get hired all the time by the federal government to do surveys on federal land that's being moved or disturbed. We were doing one down on Fort Benning on Lawson Airfield, so we're on the airfield. We're inside the fence line, and they're doing you know they're moving land. So there's dump trucks going by, but there's like 40 of us doing with shovels and digging holes, and this dump truck like comes to a halt outside the fence line. He goes, "Hey, are you guys archaeologists?" And we're like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Okay." jumps in the dump truck and drives off and comes back like 15 minutes later, hops out of the truck. And, you know, look, I grew up in Atlanta, so I can say these kinds of things, but exactly, it's exactly who you think is driving the the dump truck in South Georgia. It's homemade tank top, you know, hops out and he's got a box roughly the size of the box from seven, the movie. And he goes, Hey, um, come over here and look in the box. And we're all like, Okay. Okay. <laughs> We're inside a 12 foot high fence with concertina wire on the top. And so we go over there and when you dig in somewhere like Georgia, you're digging through clay and you're digging for something like the size of your thumbnail. That's a piece of pottery that you can help relocate native indigenous settlements. And so this guy opens up this box and it's got this one of the most amazing collections of indigenous artifacts I've ever seen in my life. And they're, they're, some of them are beautiful. And all this guy does is watch dirt spill out the back of his truck all the time. And when he sees something, he takes it. And he's like, what can you tell me about all this? And we're like, you know, almost nothing. Because we don't have the context. Yeah. We don't know how far down it came. We don't know where it came from. And so when I talk about these kinds of seemingly boring things, I'm trying to excavate them from it, it just to share their context and to share the context we're in so that we can understand that better. So there you go. No, it makes perfect <laughs> Digging sense. Holes. Yeah, that's why I bring it up. The digging holes and the digging down and understanding. I think there's there's been a lot, a massive influx of people into our industry, uh, obviously, and it continues, right? But I don't think any, I don't think people have a very solid understanding of the history and the, the things that got us to where we are today. And I think if people spent more time learning about that kind of stuff and understanding it, I think it, it would, again, alleviate some of the frustrations that people have with the current things that they're using and been better understanding why, for example, SCORM was created and, <laughs> and you know, those types of things. But it's also, it's also, yeah, you're absolutely right, Brent. I mean, it's also the, the whole fish thing about, you know, who invented water. I don't know, but I bet it wasn't fish, <laughs> right? Is, is you got to take a step back sometimes and understand the context that you're in and take a look back and go, Oh, okay. I didn't really, you know, take the, is it the red pill? Yeah. Like, One wait, you know, you're in the matrix for a reason. Right. And, and <laughs> once you understand, once you just like in games, once you start to understand the rule set, you can start to, to win. So that's what it comes down to. And that, uh, that is the, the, uh, the, the critical part of our conversation getting Very the cool. win understanding the context and getting the win that's why we're here uh speaking of getting the win next week live from dev learn so join us for a, a live session um and also brent's at the idiotic booth right beside <laughs> the domino learning systems booth and there may be some swag there just may be some swag. wow look at that might get some fun t-shirts he finally, he finally became stickers. a model brent yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Right. Well, I don't a couple think I can, of, um, I'm not going to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of book giveaways too from some uh, some guests and stuff that folks that are joining us at the idiotic half of the Domino booth too. So Indeed. check it's that out be next fun. week, gang. And we're and gang. we're going to be doing idiotic from the foyer just outside the expo oh, awesome. because it's at 7 a.m. and the <laughs> expo doesn't open till eight. So I'll have coffee and donuts for those of you that are there. Yep, yep. Good times. If you're there, join us for that. Um, I'm staying home, but. Brent will be there live and in person. Um, gang, don't forget as well, Domino Learning Systems is the reason that we're able to do this every week. So um, if there's of interest, uh, just toss a little link in the chat there. Check us out, learn a bit more. We'd be happy to help you maybe try to do some different things. So 
Indeed, and there's our LinkedIn community right there. If you guys want to join us, hang out there, and, ask uh, questions, and talk go to Caps us. and go Kraken. Ah, and uh, and uh, uh, thank God it's hockey season. And uh, I really appreciate the invite, guys, and the chance yeah, to come on. Welcome, Mark. Mark, this has been fabulous. Thank Great you so much. You. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thanks, gang. We're out of here, everybody. Here we go. Special